Okay, so we're going to be going over um, different types of atomic theories. Of course, be starting at the beginning and going in chronological order. Um, I, I'm not going to go into um, super heavy detail here since you have already been covering these, um, a lot of these theories um, since grade 9, um, especially in grade 11 where we go into them in more depth. So please be sure to I'll have a I'll have some YouTube videos um, linked um, connected to this one here so that you can um, watch more in depth for each one um, that if you want a little bit further understanding. OK, so we'll go through um, these sort of quickly and then I'll spend more time on the latest theory of the model uh, for the atom, which is what we're going to be focusing on this year. Okay, so, um, so what we're looking at here is first, the first idea of the atom came from a philosopher known as uh, Democritus. So at the time, um, we had two kind of uh, running theories. And uh, so Aristotle was the other philosopher who had the idea that all matter was made up of four elements. So not elements like our elements on the periodic table we know of now, um, but sort of elemental um, items. So there were four of them. So it was earth, or essentially soil, like ground, air, uh, water, and fire. So Aristotle used that concept to kind of explain what things were made up of. So um, the sun, for example, right? they didn't know that the sun was made up of, you know, hydrogen gas, uh, right? They would talk about how the sun was essentially a ball of fire. Uh, so Democrates had a different idea saying that, well, matter's not made up of fire, earth, uh, water, and um, wind, right, or air. Uh, it's actually made of these small little particles, which he coined the term an atom. An atom is essentially meaning in Greek not to be cut, right? So meaning that it was indivisible. And at the time, re really nobody believed him. So everyone believed Aristotle's idea and actually everyone thought that Democritus was crazy, okay? Uh, so... Uh, unfortunately, he died thinking that, you know, people thought he was a madman. However, you know, fast forward, you know, approximately 2,000 years, uh, and John Dalton comes along, right, um, and essentially proved or helped to prove that that idea of an atom was actually correct. So prove that the smallest, the smallest particle of matter uh, that cannot be created or destroyed is the atom. And his model of the atom is sometimes known as the billiard ball uh, model. So basically, he believed that the atom was a dense, uh, spherical-shaped structure, and it was featureless. So meaning that uh, right now, there is nothing known about what is inside of this. Um, it was just believed that it was a particle of whatever it happens to be. So let's say we're talking about, um, you know, gold. So he believed if you were to take this chunk of gold and cut it in half and then maybe cut it in half again and then in half again and again and again, eventually you would get to the smallest possible particle of gold that you could have. And it had this spherical shape. So right now we don't know anything about, you know, there's no electrons, protons or neutron knowledge. It's just a solid sphere of matter. Now, uh, there was, in fact, proof that elements were different from one another. So the atoms of one element are identical. So meaning this entire bar of gold will all have the same type of atoms. Um, and the different elements are um, have different particles. So if I have a bar of gold and then a bar of silver or a bar of iron, right, they're all going to have different types of um, these atoms that make them up. Now, uh, for each of these ideas, I'm going to also talk about some of the evidence that helped to support that theory. So theories are really an idea 
uh, that's usually supported by different types of uh, either experimental data or concepts. And really the theory is always held true until something comes along or someone comes along and disproves it. Okay, so there's two key things, or technically three key things, that, um, that Dalton helped to um, begin the idea of. So one is the law of conservation of mass. So this goes back to balancing chemical equations. Why do we balance a reaction when we write it out? So this essentially means that matter is not created or destroyed. Uh, whatever you start a reaction with, you have to finish with the exact same thing. You might have the atoms that are rearranging shape, um, uh, like it's rearranging their orientation with maybe what they're with or what they're connected to. But if you start with five atoms of hydrogen, you should end up with five atoms of hydrogen at the end, right? So the mass that you start with, you should also end with. Law of definite composition uh, essentially means that when you have, um, let's say you have a glass of water, okay? So when we have uh, water particles that are making up this portion of water, right? Law of definite composition essentially means that a particle of water is always the same as other particles of water, right? So there's always going to be two hydrogens and an oxygen, right? So let's say here I have my little water particle. So imagine this is an oxygen. These are my two hydrogens, right? If you were to look at all of the water particles, it is uh, definite, right? So the composition of what makes up this molecule is always the same. Uh, same thing as when I'm looking at this bar of gold, all of the atoms that are in that um, bar of gold are identical. So think of the term, right? Composition is kind of like what makes up a substance and definite means unchanging, okay? Law of marked multiple propor proportions, pardon me, um, goes kind of hand in hand with this. So law of multiple proportions essentially means when you do have a molecule where you have um, different types of elements coming together, right? So let's look at the water again, H2O. Uh, this is talking, dis essentially discussing the ratio that you have those elements in existence. So meaning water is always a two to one ratio between hydrogen and oxygen. If you no longer have two hydrogens and one oxygen, uh, you're not going to have um, a particle of water. It's something else, right? I mean, if I were to add uh, another oxygen here whoop, to two, I would now have hydrogen peroxide. So when you have a glass full of water, it's always a ratio of two to one for hydrogen to oxygen. It doesn't matter if you have one molecule, one liter, or 10,000 liters. The proportion that you have those elements in is going to be constant. Okay, so Dalton, we have uh, this solid spherical atom. And now we have another scientist that's going to come along and actually change up our idea of what is happening inside of the atom. So J.J. Thompson has come along and his main contribution. So every scientist, um, I don't really care if you know the dates. That's not what's important here. What's important is what did that person contribute? What is their main idea for the atom that was different from what everyone else's idea was previous to them? So Thompson's main contribution is he essentially proved the existence of electrons, okay? That's the main idea. Now, how did he believe the electrons were distributed in the atom is actually in this, um, this image is a nice one here describing it. So he believed that those negative electrons were embedded within a, char a positive charged sphere. So meaning, so originally, right, remember Dalton was a solid sphere with really nothing much going on, like a solid dense space. Here now we're starting to have the idea of having something embedded within that solid sphere. So uh, meaning our negative charges, which is our electron, and the actual um, space where those electrons are found in is in a positive cloud. 
Okay, so meaning we now have um, some empty space. However, that space is charged. Okay, now um, I will have a link to his um, experiment, discussing this experiment here. But what he did is he used the cathode ray, and you'll notice that that's part of his experimental evidence that helped to prove this. Um, so he used a cathode ray tube that essentially proved that when you had a negative charge that was close to an atom, that the negative and negative charges actually repelled one another. Essentially, to kind of just summarize it very briefly, it proved there had to be something negative inside of the atom because it was repelled by a negative um, charge, okay? So it essentially proves something in there is negative. So the positive charge, this positive sphere that's around the electrons, actually was never proved. Okay, this was not proved. This was part of the theory that he had. So this was a proof. The electron was Thompson's main contribution. How he hypothesized that that electron was in the atom was in this positive spherical cloud. Okay, So uh, this is a very common misconception. A lot of people believe that he proved that there was negative and positive things, and that's not true. He proved that there was the electron. Um, he hypothesized that there was something positive there because he believed there had to be something positive to balance out the negative that was, in fact, there. Okay? So, Thompson obviously, of course, has his own evidence to prove this. So, some of the supporting pieces here and the scientists that contributed... So Arrhenius, which you may have heard of in grade 11 when you're talking about solutions. Uh, so Arrhenius proved that you can have ions in solution. So meaning there are charges. So you now have charges that are in your solution, whether it's positive or negative, right? So essentially it's proving there has to be something within this sphere, right? That's changing the charge of that particular atom. Uh, Faraday essentially did a very similar idea. He proved that atoms could become ions by gaining or losing electrons. And Crookes uh, is a scientist who essentially did a lot of work uh, in the physics field and proved that electricity was essentially a flow of negative particles, which we now know are those electrons, right? So electrons are essentially make up electricity. Now, for the experimental evidence, you should be able to understand why this supports this idea. Okay, it's not really important that you know every single person here, but I would say it's, it's good to know at least one piece of evidence that is supportive for that main um, scientist model of the atom. So this atom model, I don't think I mentioned it, uh, it's been referred to for many different names. So we have a chocolate chip cookie model, so it's like the chocolate chip, the cookie part is like the positive sphere. And then the negative uh, electrons are like the little chocolate chips. Sometimes it's called the raisin bun model, right? The little raisins are the electrons. Um, plum pudding model is another one that you'll see uh, said quite often, which is kind of like, I guess, uh, a pudding that has, I guess, little plums in it. Uh, and I've never had a plum pudding, but uh, anyways, the most common one, I guess, uh, in Canada is probably, you know, that you're most uh, comfortable with, that you've seen a lot, I'm sure, is a chocolate chip cookie. So, uh, so let's continue. So Rutherford is the next scientist. So remember, up until now, I'll kind of recap the little what we know going on in the side here. So right now, this is what's believed. We know that we have negative electrons and we think that they are in a positive sphere. So Rutherford actually uh, kind of jumped off this idea. So if you remember, Thompson hypothesized about the positive sphere. So what uh, Rutherford set out to do is to try and look a little bit further into that idea of the positives. 